Let me buy you something to eat. No. You have to choose, Felix. Our friendship or your training. My training. <laughs> Goodbye for now. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're telling me. You're telling me that you just finished Fire Emblem Three Houses for the Nintendo Switch. And now suddenly you want to get into Fire Emblem? But you don't know which game to start at? Because there's like, what, 16 games? Well, my friend, do I got a solution for you. I made a video for this. You'd actually be surprised how much I see this question post online and within my friend group. You know, a lot of people love Three Houses, they play it, they love it, and they want to continue exploring the series, but there's just one problem. They don't know where to go from there. You know, there's a lot of different Fire Emblem games that span across many generations of consoles and handhelds. Where do you even begin from there? I mean, just look at them. You got NES, SNES, GBA, 3DS, Switch, Wii, GameCube. You've got a lot to choose from. And that's why I made this video, so I can hopefully provide some insight into what you may seek from the series in general. Now, Fire Emblem Three Houses is what I like to call a trihexa game. That's not a real word, but whatever, we'll roll with it. Basically, what I mean by that is there are three main components of Three Houses that I like to divide the game into. There's the world map feature and the open-endedness of the game, which allows you to perform quests and to ground your units to how you see fit. There's the monastery slash support section, which allows you to build rapport around your army and to bond with your units and to just generally see what your army is like, you know, what ticks them, what makes them irk. And lastly, you have the core mechanics of Fire Emblem, which is the combat section. You place your units on the field and you watch them fight each other. Well, not fight each other, you know, hopefully they fight the enemy because that is the goal of Fire Emblem. But regardless, I feel that knowing which of these three main cores of three houses you most enjoyed can really provide a clear insight into what you may seek from the series and will help you determine what game you want to play and pursue in the future. Now, I don't want to stall this intro too long, so I will be providing timestamps in the video that will direct you to the core concept in which you desire most from your next Fire Emblem game. In those sections, I will be highlighting which games best fit that concept and I will also be giving a quick summary of what that game entails. Now, without further delay, let's jump right into the video. So, you found yourself in the monastery section, huh? Well, in that case, I'm going to assume you've enjoyed the prospects of tea time, support conversations, and giving gifts to your army. Well, in that case, I would recommend these three games from the 3DS era to satisfy those needs. Well, Technically, there's five games, but more on that some other time. Fire Emblem Fates and Fire Emblem Awakening offer a huge cast of characters, each with their own vibrant and unique personalities that can support each other as well as fight alongside each other in the front lines. In addition, there's also a marriage feature which can allow characters to marry each other, and seeing as both games have an avatar, you can choose your own waifu or husbando to spend your happily ever after with. Specifically with Fire Emblem Fates, you may notice that there are actually three games in this series of games, which are Birthright, Conquest, and Revelations. If you truly want the best cast and the best army in terms of supporting each other and vibrant personalities, I would recommend Revelations as it combines both the cast of Birthright and Conquest to create this huge, wacky mess of an army each with their own conflicting personalities that can make for some really wacky hijinks. As for Fire Emblem 15, also known as Shadows of Valencia, while it may have a much smaller cast compared to the past two games, it also features what I believe to be the best support conversations in all of Fire Emblem, and their characters are really well fleshed out, and even though the, all the characters can't support each other, the ones they can support with really make for some deep conversations and generally really great insights into each of the characters that they think can support with. However, I will note that Fire Emblem Awakening and Fates do have somewhat weaker stories than other past entries in the series, 
and it comparatively to three houses is nowhere near as complex and deep however these three games are still great and i would highly recommend them as for the difficulty of these games they all feature an easy normal and hard mode so anyone from any skill level can delve into the series as well as a casual mode so that even if your units die they will be brought back the next map so if you really just do want to enjoy talking with your units and supporting each other without having to fear the prospects of death i would highly recommend these three games for your next fire emblem game being creative <sighs> oh posh fine i admit it you said you liked my greetings and i perhaps wanted you to like me more but claire if you enjoyed the open-endedness of doing quests slaying monsters exploring places and the open-endedness of the promotion systems of three houses then these are the games i would recommend for that specific reason that would be fire emblem gaiden fire emblem sacred stones fire emblem awakening fire emblem fates and fire emblem shadows of valencia as for fire emblem fates and awakening they feature a world map where you are allowed to grind your units to your heart's content as well as fight demons of the netherworld and invading armies. As well, these games feature a promotion path branching system where units can branch out into different promotion paths as well as demote themselves in case you want to go back and fix up some of your classes. As for the other three games, they focus more on the world map system and the exploration section of Fire Emblem. For example, in Fire Emblem Sacred Stones, the world map also features two dungeons where you can explore them and fight a gauntlet of demons and monsters inside these dungeons for cool loot. This game also features a promotion branch system, but it's somewhat more linear than Fates and Awakening. Now I know what you're thinking, how can a promotion branch be linear? Well, in this game, you can't exactly demote your units, so you're kind of limited to only two classes. But a cool tidbit about Sacred Stones is that you can experience the story from two perspectives, being Erica and her brother Ephraim. Will you choose to infiltrate the Empire with a small army as Ephraim, or will you go around from the other side and recruit an army and try and recruit your friends as Erica? The choice is yours, and I would highly recommend Sacred Stones the most from this list of five. As for Fire Emblem Gaiden and Shadows of Valencia, they feature dungeons which allow you to freely roam your character as you would in the monastery in three houses. As well, you can encounter enemies in the dungeon overworld and fight them and engage them in combat. In addition, Shadows of Valencia features a post-game dungeon which features some of the strongest enemies in the series and the best loot available in the game. However, Fire Emblem Gaiden is an NES game and is actually the second Fire Emblem game to come out and it may seem very archaic in terms of its design, but if you are into the old school NES games, then I would highly recommend it as it is one of my favorite Fire Emblem games. But if you are into the more practicality and functionality of modern games, then Shadows of Valencia is definitely more suited for you than Gaiden. Now, for the gameplay of those two games, the story segments are not separated into separate chapters, but rather by acts. There are a total of five acts in the game, and each act is controllable with their own character pieces. The first act is controllable by one army, while the second act is controllable by another army. By the third act, you'll have control of both armies, but they will be in separate places. So in that case, you'll have to maneuver the world map with two separate armies and try and meet together at a certain vantage point where you can complete the game together. All in all, if you're looking for a Fire Emblem experience where you can freely tackle chapters at your choice and freely control your army, I would personally recommend these 5 games to add to your repertoire, with my personal recommendation and favorite being Sacred Stones. <sighs> yep, I definitely feel stronger. This section is going to feature the largest cast of Fire Emblem games. So I'll be doing my best to go over each of the games individually and to highlight the key points of what makes them stand out from the others. Fire Emblem 1, also known as Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, is the first Fire Emblem. There's not much to say about this one without comparing to the others, so let's move on. You have Every 3 also known as Mystery of the Emblem, which not only features a remake of the first Fire Emblem, 
but also features its own story, which is a sequel that takes place after the events of FE1. Now, FE3 and FE1 are very vanilla Fire Emblem games. What this means is that there's no world map, there's no support conversations, there's no overworld feature, they're very vanilla and basic Fire Emblem games, but in terms of functionality, map design, enemy placement, and general gameplay, they're very solid games and still hold up well today. Well, maybe not FE1 so much, but definitely FE3 holds up well to this day. Now, as we move on to the Super Nintendo, this is where things start to get a little creative in terms of gameplay differences. We have Fire Emblem 4, also known as Genealogy of the Holy War, which features a system that was actually not present in three houses called the Weapon Triangle, where a system of weapons defeat other weapons in a rock, paper, scissors format. You have swords beat axes, axes beat lances, and lances beat swords. It also features its own magic system where fire beats wind, wind beats lightning, and lightning beats fire. Within that magic system as well, you also have light and dark, where light beats dark, and darkness beats all of the elements of nature. Fire Emblem 4 also features really huge maps that are only separated into 10 chapters, well, 10 chapters plus the prologue, and the maps are very sparse down and huge, and they highly favor mounted units that can move across the map very fast and quickly. And also in addition, the objectives involve taking down castles and capturing castles, as opposed to just simply defeating the boss. And the armies are very more sparse out, and the enemy placement tends to be more creative, for better or for worse. In addition, it also features a more darker and mature story for fans of the series that will definitely captivate you. Genealogy Holy War is actually one of my favorites in terms of its story, as it really does it's just a super interesting story. I really don't know what else to say. Without, you know, spoiling things at least. Now, Fire Emblem 5, also known as Thracia 776, returns back to form in terms of map design and chapter progression. So we're back to regular sized maps and the chapters are back to being around 20 or so. However, they introduce a new system called the Capture System, which allows you to creatively fight enemies and capture them which then allows you to steal their weapons for your own army to make use of. So for example, if you see a really cool silver lance that you want to steal from a random mook soldier, all you gotta do is have a higher constitution, capture him, take his silver lance, dispose of him, and you're good to go. However, there's also a new feature that may also work against you called the fatigue system. Units will eventually grow tired of fighting, and if they grow too tired during a map, in the next map they won't be available to use. Although this could be seen as a bad thing, it also actively encourages you to use a wider cast of your army and to try out different units to see what works best. A big controversy around this game is that a lot of people believe this game is not for beginners, and while I will agree that this game is definitely not newcomer friendly, I firmly believe that any Fire game can be beaten by anyone with the right amount of thinking and enemy and unit placement. All it takes is for someone to just think about what they're doing and to not mindlessly zug zug their way through maps. As long as you follow those key notions, I believe that anyone can beat any map in any Fire Emblem game. I'd also like to note that just because you lose a unit does not mean you have to reset. Sometimes sacrifices do have to be made and a lot of Fire Emblem games often give you a big enough cast where anyone can be replaced, well, you know, except for your main character. But regardless of that point, anyone can be replaced and I firmly believe that you could sacrifice units to progress maps if you have to. So think about that when you're trying out the more difficult games of the series. Speaking of difficulty, did you know none of these games actually feature tutorial for newer players? In fact, the next game also doesn't have a tutorial. Fire Emblem 6, also known as the Divine Blade I think? Man, who cares what it's called? Anyways, this game features Rory as the main character. Some of a lot of you may know Rory from the Smash Bros series. In terms of mechanics and gameplay, this game is very vanilla and simple. In fact, it's very comparable to Fire Emblem 3. There's nothing really wacky or crazy about this game. It's a very simple, very solid game that I would recommend for newer players. But Speaking of tutorials, we have Entering Fire Emblem 7, also known as Fire Emblem in the West. 
Fire Emblem 7 features an in-game tutorial that teaches you the very basics of Fire Emblem mechanics, such as weapons, classes, weapon effectiveness, the weapon triangle, placing your units, and recruiting enemy units. It's a very solid vanilla game and is highly recommended for newcomers of the series as they will get a very good understanding of the core concepts of the series. In terms of its story, it's a very vanilla story, very... it's not bad, not great, it's very simple. One cool thing about this game though is that after you beat the main story, you can play the same story from the perspective of the other main character that allows you to access additional chapters and to get things from their side of the story and to just see how they react to the world around them. Something I forgot to highlight is that other games in the series do possess a skill system like in Three Houses and Path of Radiance is no exception to this. In addition, they also feature a new system called the Bonus EXP system. So once you complete certain map objectives and maps, you gain bonus EXP that's stored in a, let's call it a jar. Once you're in your main hub in between chapters, you can allocate those bonus experience points among your units and your armies to level them up without having them to fight. So let's say you have a beautiful archer that you want to train, but they're way too weak to fight in the army. Just give them some bonus EXP, level them up, and they're good to go without having to fight. In addition, Path of Radiance also features a convoy where you can go and do forges to your weapons. So for example, if you have your iron sword that you for some reason treasure a lot, you can forge it and give it more durability, you can give it a higher crit, higher hit rate, and more power, and even give it a name. At the cost of some gold of course, so don't be cheap. The next game, Radiant Dawn, is a sequel to Path of Radiance, and it features all the same mechanics of Path of Radiance, just more upgraded, more bells and whistles, and just generally more refined. Instead here, I'm going to talk about why people think they shouldn't recommend this game. A lot of people believe that just like Thrasia, this game is not newcomer friendly, and once again, I wholeheartedly disagree with that. As long as you understand enemy placement, enemy movement, and what your army can do, you can generally beat this game comfortably and just have a smooth sailing. Just once again, don't zug zug or unga bunga with your way through maps and you should have a good time. Also as a side note, these games feature beast units that allow you to transform some of your units into beasts such as dragons, tigers, and wolves. So if you are into animal units and anamorphic units, there's that as well. And lastly we have FE11 and FE12 which are remakes of FE1 and FE3, once again featuring Marth as a main character. Since these are remakes of older games, they feature much more modern functionality and updated mechanics, such as the weapon triangle system. In addition, these games do feature their own mechanic called the class chain system. If you want to have 5 mages, you can do that. You want 7 cavaliers, you can do that. At the cost of... Nothing actually, it doesn't cost anything to class change, and it's an instant snap process so you can tackle maps any way you want and your repeated playthroughs will always be unique and fresh. These two games also feature to what I beat the best map design in all of Fire Emblem and the best enemy placement. It also features some of the best difficulty scaling as there is a difficulty setting for any player with the hardest one being just right and it really does make you think about your enemy placements and even force you to use diverse and thoughtful class change in order to tackle maps. And these two games, especially FE12, are just some of the best games in the series that I would definitely recommend to any player of Fire Emblem. As a side note, I do highly recommend Fire Emblem Conquest if you're looking for meaningful and thoughtful gameplay. I just didn't want to give it its own section because I felt that I highlighted Fates way too much in this review and didn't want to make it take too much spotlight away from the other games. All in all, these are the games I would highly recommend if you are looking for thoughtful gameplay. In my opinion, I think the best out of all of these is Fire Emblem 12. It really has the best map design, the best enemy placement, and it really makes you think, really think about what you're doing in maps and not just trying to smash your head against the wall and hoping that something will work, you really do need to think about what you're doing if you want to succeed at these maps. Hopefully this video gave you a great insight into the series and helped you make a decision as to what you want for your next Fire Emblem game. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. 
I will definitely try to do more videos like these to help out people of not just Fire Emblem, but also other series as well. I also like to do challenge runs of various games to challenge myself and to provide entertainment to everyone, so look forward to that. And with that, Buku out. Peace. Thank you.